Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to Lowell National Historical Park today. Um, we have a wonderful day today of many different speakers and events. Um, this park was actually established to interpret and preserve the stories and structures associated with the Industrial Revolution in Lowell and its legacy. And that legacy is what you're going to be hearing all about today. Um, as a Portuguese American, I am very proud to have this day um, and to learn of all of the different contributions that the Portuguese made in New England. Um, without further ado, you'll hear more from me throughout the day. I'd like to introduce the gentleman who has made this all happen with UMass Lowell, the executive director of the Saab Center for Portuguese Studies, Dr. Frank Sousa. Uh, uh, welcome, everyone. Bem-vindos a todos uh, to uh, Looking Back, Looking Forward, Continuity and Change in Greater Boston's uh, Portuguese Community. Uh, the SOP Center, as many of you already know, promotes the study of the Portuguese language, literature, and culture at the university and beyond, uh, and also fosters the documentation and study of the Portuguese-American experience in the region and beyond. Uh, with the second objective in mind, uh, the Center has organized two exhibitions to date uh, and uh, that you've heard about, uh, about the history of the Portuguese in Lowell. Uh, and I was going to talk a little bit about that, but I want to jump to the next paragraph. Um, uh, in other words, you remember Lure the Spindle from 2015, and more recently, as you saw in the foyer there, uh, the uh, exhibition from the Atlantic Islands to Lowell Mass, Continuity and Change in the Greater Lowell Portuguese community that uh, the first was sponsored by uh, the uh, uh, Mass Humanities, the NEH uh, stateside, and the second by Enterprise Bank. Um, and we have the curators of the second exhibition here, Professor Ferrant and Dr. Fitzsimons. Uh, so in keeping uh, with the mission of uh, reaching out to the Portuguese in the region, an understudied and sometimes underrepresented group, the South Center is in the process of developing the Greater Boston Portuguese American Digital Archive, whose mission is to identify, collect, and preserve for students, faculty, and the general public, and historians, etc., a range of historical and contemporary resources connected to the region's Portuguese-speaking communities. You'll be hearing a lot more about that over the next few months as we'll be doing, hopefully, a, a public announcement in the fall. Uh, before uh, I introduce Professor Ferrant, uh, the colloquium's keynote speaker who is here to my left, I would like to thank Superintendent Bernardo Celeste, uh, who's all the way in the back, and members of the team, uh, including John Marciano and Phil Lovschwitz for so graciously and generously receiving us today. Uh, I'm also grateful to the elected officials, who were, most of whom are here already, uh, who at 11 in the morning will participate in the round table, in a round table to explore interesting issues around Portuguese American identity and public service in the Commonwealth. Uh, the SOP Center is further thankful to the panelists who will at 1.30 p.m. reflect on growing up in Portu Portuguese in Lowell. Uh, and the Center also appreciates the fact that the Holy Ghost Band of Lowell will perform at Boarding House Park right outside of the museum at 3 p.m. So we'll have a concert at 3 p.m. to end today's proceedings. Uh, and uh, it is now uh, uh, my honor and privilege to introduce a great friend of the South Center, Dr. Robert Ferrant, a uh, distinguished professor of history at UMass Lowell, prolific author, and the recipient of many prestigious awards, including the Mass uh, His History Commendation from the National Endowment for the Humanities. He is the lead curator of the exhibit in the foyer and is working on the first chapter of a book on the history of the Portuguese in Lowell being prepared by the Center for Portuguese Studies and edited by Dr. Fitzsimons, right in front of me here. Uh, his keynote address today is titled Overworked, Underpaid, but uh, Making Their Way the Portuguese in Lowell, Mass, 1880, 1980. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. So I do this with great trepidation since I'm French, Canadian, Irish, and Italian. Um, so we'll see how this works. Um, but I've had the pleasure, I can honestly say, in working on this history for a while, the exhibit outside and other things. And I've learned a lot, and it's helpful and useful because I teach immigration history to learn a lot more stories and get a lot more stuff. 
Uh, it makes my teaching hopefully a little bit more interesting for my students. So we'll see for you whether you feel the same uh, at the end of my presentation. Um, so I've done some new research, combined some of this with what's outside to try to give an overview. I'm going to kind of move um, in the interest of time somewhat quickly. Uh, but if anybody sees anything wrong, you don't have to yell at me. Just go like this, and then I'll come see you later. And see, uh, <laughs> what was wrong? Uh, so that we can so that we can fix it. Um, a quote that I use a lot when I start immigration history talks of one kind or another um, is this one. Once I thought to write a history of the immigrants in America, then I discovered that the immigrants were American history. Uh, and I think it's useful to keep that in mind. I think it's extraordinarily useful to keep the quote in mind with all the conversations and the polemics going on today about immigration that um, central to the US story, central to the story of the 18th, 19th, 20th, and now 21st century is the constant replenishment of ideas, cultures, food, music, politics, and we are who we are in, in 2019. I was almost going to say 1919. Uh, we're who we are in 2019 because we're the sum of that that mix, that clash combination. Um, and to think otherwise is really, I think, to misread American history. I also like this because it shows that one of the things that Portuguese community does fairly quickly after they get here, and we'll talk more about this as they go along, is start to build small businesses, build enterprises, stores, markets, uh, clothing stores, shoe stores, all sorts of things to contribute to the economic vitality. Um, of the city. Um, so a little bit of more boring stuff, but just to create some context, between 1890 and 1920, official records indicate that about a million Portuguese emigrated, right? But roughly only 16% came to the United States. Many more went to Brazil, for example. Lots of people went to Brazil and then came to the United States, but lots of people went to Brazil um, first. Only about 5% um, of that initial wave ended up directly into the United States. Um, and again, then people eventually make um, their way here. Um, in 1900, the start of the 20th century, about 18,000 foreign-born Portuguese in Massachusetts located, no surprise to th those of you in the room, um, in six counties, but with the most in Bristol County uh, and Middlesex County. Bristol County, by far, Fall River, New Bedford, having the larger number um, of people um, as compared to Lowell. So Middlesex County, where we are, about 10 percent, um, 63, 64 uh, percent in um, in uh, Fall River and New Bedford. And in 1920, that population grows again. So you can see the influx of people in those first two decades of the 20th century, because we go from about 18,000 to 50,000. Um, in that roughly 20-year period. That 20-year period, I should say, marks the emigration from several countries in Southern and Eastern Europe, uh, which changed the character and the face of immigration into the United States. Prior to that, the bulk of people coming into the United States are coming largely from Western European countries. Uh, but around 1900, that shifts. Um, and that's going to have something to do with the story in a few minutes. So just kind of hold that idea um, in your mind. Uh, not surprisingly, people come here for work. I've been reading lots and lots of oral histories and older histories of Portuguese in New England, in the United States, and consistently in all of those, again, no big surprise, people end up in Fall River and New Bedford because of the mills, and they end up in Lowell because of the mills. Uh, there's work, right? Most people coming from southern and Eastern Europe, my own um, grandparents who come from Southern Italy, crop failures, bad wine grapes, all sorts of bad harvests. Eventually, they move to Northern Italy to try to make money. They can't, and then separately, they meet when they get here. Um, they leave Italy because they can't make a go of it. And that, again, is a fairly typical story. Most people, and again, it might not be your story in the room, but most people internally migrate before they actually leave. They try to stay. 
And this is really clear in the more general immigration history um, that I've been looking at, that other historians have been doing. It's not likely, again, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen, right? But it's not likely that people just directly say, okay, I'm out of here and leave Portugal. They may go to another part of Portugal for a while. They may go to Spain. They may go someplace else in Europe to see if they can make money. Nobody wants to come across the Atlantic just for the fun of it. It's incredibly dangerous. It's a long trip. People get sick and die along the way. Uh, people get all kinds of diseases along the way. I'm laughing, but this is all part of the story, right? And so people don't do this lightly, right? So if you have ancestors who made the trip, praise them, because it was an ordeal. It was, and again, I think my students at least, again, different in the room, but just sort of think this was sort of like, you know, you got on a plane and just like came over, right? And no, that wasn't the case. That was not the case, right? I can't, I can't say that um, enough. Bob, it was 20 days from the Azores to the Providence, Rhode Island in 1900. 40 days. Most in steerage. 20 days. 20, 20. 20 days, most in steerage. On a good trip. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So imagine being seasick for 19 and a half days. <laughs> um, and then not being quite sure when you get here what it is you're going to find once you get here. Um, so. Um, I like this photo a lot, pretty much shows, if anybody knows anybody in there, let me know. I've been trying to identify faces, but uh, the Suffolk Mill, this is around 1910. This is a photo next door in the center below history that shows a number of Portuguese mill workers um, at the time. So by 1900 in Lowell, again, no big deal. We know the mills are here. There's about 90,000 people living in the city. A third of those are engaged in working in textile mills. It's a pretty significant number of people. And then if you count their families, their kids, um, the extended business enterprises that relate to the textile mills, sell them stuff, sell them machinery, um, the textile industry, again, is where the action is. This is going to come to bear um, as we move further on as well. Uh, in 1910, so think of the city, 75% of the population um, our first or second generation immigrants um, in 1900, 42% are foreign born. So we're almost half a foreign born city in terms of the population of Lowell. Uh, and again, the Portuguese are a part of that. In 1910, 20%, only 20% of people living in the city, one in five, only one in five people are, of native, born, are native born of native born parents. So when people refer to Lowell, or you could probably, if I had the statistics for Fall River and New Bedford, they probably would be very similar. Um, or a place like Salem or Lynn or Holyoke out in Western Mass. Um, it would be pretty much, again, the same. So again, it's not hyperbole to say that the growth of the American economy, the growth of the industrial economy, the growth of the wealth comes from immigrant workers, right? The ability of Lowell's mills to expand um, is partly caused by the fact that people keep coming. It's sort of a confluence of the mills need to grow. To grow, they need workers. People in Europe who can't make a living are looking for a place to do it. It's sort of like the perfect good storm, I guess you could say, of sort of, of, of immigration history. And so, again, not surprisingly, large portions of the Portuguese population work in the mills. And here's one of the keys. The average weekly pay for foreign-born workers is about $11.92 a week. For men, $7.90 for women. No big surprise, right? Women are being paid less than men um, back then, and we still haven't figured out how to fix that. Uh, but for Portuguese workers, considerably lower. Some of this is a function of what happens in American industry the more recent the immigrant population, oftentimes the lower the wage. If people have been here a while, their kids, if their kids are working in the mills, maybe they do a little bit better. Maybe they have a more prestigious job in the mill. Maybe they now have a skill, or they might be a supervisor or something where they're making a little bit more money. But the race is uh, not an equal race right from the beginning. People are paid significantly less money. Uh, and this comes from federal government figures, federal government documents. Come on. Sure. 
change. You're going to quit on it. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Let's go back. Um, this is sort of difficult to see, but the area here that's sort of yellow, hopefully you can see on the map, this is largely where the Portuguese population ends up. Uh, and largely where it is still today, Lawrence, the Lawrence Street area, back central, going up Gorham toward the Lowell Connector, um, that neighborhood um, is here on the map. And so the, in the history of Lowell, different parts of the city become different immigrant neighborhoods. The swath up here uh, is largely what's referred to these days as Little Canada, where the French Canadian population was. So if you think of the UMass Lowell campus, for those of you that know it, where all the dormitories are, where the Songus Arena is, where the baseball stadium is, that whole area at one point was referred to as Little Canada. That's all knocked down in the 1960s. There's about 3,000 people living there when urban renewal comes along. There's about 300 structures um, that pretty much gets dislocated. There's going to be an attempt made a little bit later in the 20th century to do somewhat a similar thing to the Portuguese neighborhood. Uh, which I'm going to talk about um, at the end of my presentation. This would have been the kind of structures people would have lived in. Initially, these are right along the back of the canal. But if you were um, in the city, if you were a newcomer, you generally would end up in somewhat the older uh, housing stock. Again, more affordable. Uh, but you would be living in uh, places like this that backed up along either the canal or the river. I mean, again, over up Lawrence Street where the Concord River is coming um, back down in through that neighborhood. Um, I found this photo the other day, and I thought it was really um, fascinating. I want to figure out more. Um, this is a photo that was in the, one of the Lowell newspapers. We can't get drowned now. This is the quotes from these kids. So living in Lowell was not necessarily a, a, a safe place, right? And so this is referring to this new fence that gets built up along one of the canals. Uh, to keep kids from falling in and drowning. And at the bottom piece of it, if you can't quite see it, it says 64 children have been drowned from this un unfenced bank during the last 36 years. So great progress in Lowell, there's a fence. <laughs> to keep kids from wandering into and falling into the canals. It just, it, again, gives you a flavor for sort of what people were dealing with as they... Bob, it was only through a city ordinance that a Democratic city council passed it, that required fencing. The Locks and Canals Corporation fought it tooth and nail. Yeah, it was an expense, right? Building and maintaining a fence would be costly. Um, Portuguese families as they settle in, large extended families, um, usually people got here um, somewhat in the early stages of migration, one at a time. Somebody would be sent out, I liken them to like being a prospector, looking for gold. One person would go out and figure out if they found anything, and then if they did, call for more back call for backup. Um, and so oftentimes an older son, or in some cases a father would come without mom and the kids, get here for a while, um, maybe go back and then bring people over, or stay here but periodically send for somebody um, to come over and meet them. Mm -hmm. Often, this is pretty much, uh, again, a fairly typical, a fairly typical case. Uh, boarding houses get opened up in the city um, along the area that I was referring to before on the map. Um, and the boarding houses generally become places for single men. And again, the idea of people, uh, people coming over. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead. Good morning, good morning. Um, and so, um, so people would, again, single men would come over and need a place to live. If there were um, women here already, Portuguese women, they might run a boarding house for single men. That boarding house might have 10, uh, 10 12, 15 uh, single men living in it. I can't imagine. Just think about a dormitory. Uh, and what that must have been like with 15 um, young uh, textile mill workers and what the person running the boarding house had to go through. But again, this was the way that a nucleus of the community got built. So people would have been working in the mills, living near the mills where they worked, um, and again, eventually reuniting everybody in, in one big happy family. Um, oftentimes, when people were here, 
they would send money back. So if you got here as a single male in a family and you were making enough money, um, you would send money home, right? Which immigrants still do to this day. It's a fairly common um, occurrence in immigrant families. And probably, again, if you poke at your own histories, there's something in there. It also made the person here feel uh, like a big shot. <laughs> that you could send money back was like, I've made it, right? I can send you money. Um, and so people um, sort of in the village would be very happy. I mean, in reading some things you know, about this sort of exchange, people would be excited when a letter came from America with some money in it. Uh, my son has made it in America. Would be like a big deal in the, uh, in the home uh, in the home village. Sometimes that money would be put aside and then used for a ticket to bring people here. Fairly quickly, one of the, I mean, this is too long to read, but um, this is a really brilliant article that's written about how culture starts embedding itself in the city um, as people are here for a while. These Portuguese bands become incredibly important um, to the community. This is from 1929. This is a bigger version um, of that same picture. There could be people in the room that know somebody in this photo, for all I know. Um, anybody know somebody in the picture? That'd be cool. Own up. Um, they, were, they were in a band, so maybe they were, I don't know, but <laughs> it's a great photo. Again, showing the community. And church, obviously, we know this incredibly important. This is a great photograph of a huge church picnic in 1926. So you can also see, again, thinking of what I said before, where in the 1890s, early 1900s, it's a lot of single men coming. When you look at this photo now, you see lots of women and lots of kids. The, the, the community has become somewhat stable. Uh, people are here to stay. People are sinking roots. Church, culture, um, religion, uh, all of this sort of stuff, manifestations of the strength of the community. And again, as well, businesses. I loved, I found this ad in uh, one of the city directories, and basically it was the motto for this store, quick sales and small profits. <laughs> so I'm not sure that would be like the advertising sign somebody would use today to promote their business. Come shop here, quick sales and small profits. I don't know. But again, this would have been fairly typical, up off Gorham, up that way in Lowell, uh, along where the connector sort of cuts through today. <laughs> More stores, bakeries, things like this. Now these two photos I really like. I used, I've used these before, so some of you may have seen them. But see this young girl right there, standing on that box? This is a family photo, and now she's standing on a chair. For some reason, <laughs> she... In, in, in these photos, she likes being on top of something. Um, which again, you know, just quite by accident, when I was looking at the photos, I said, wait. Um, and so this is her, Mary, who, who basically had the photos in her family and then donated them to the Center for World History. But it is just a really fascinating sort of glimpse again. Uh, family, in this case, of uh, bakers. So, as the 20th century progresses, significant numbers of the Portuguese settling um, into Lola are coming from Madeira, uh, and as well from other islands. And so this is a fairly typical story. Again, this is in an oral history that sits over at the Center for Lowell History. Uh, by 1920, the voyage is a little more sane, seven days, not 20. Um, he comes over, John Palante, as 16-year-old, his sister's already working in the Tremont Mills. That's a photograph of her from, the fa from a family collection. He comes because his dad passes away. Uh, mom in Portugal has seven kids. No way to take care of them. Sister's already here, so he comes over. That's a photograph of him. Works in the Tremont Mills. When work gets slow, he takes jobs in other mills around the area. He goes to Newmarket, New Hampshire. Works in a silk mill that's in Newmarket, New Hampshire. Um, that silk mill eventually actually comes to Lowell. Um, and what's fascinating is um, as the textile industry closes down, his sister, the reason why he comes to Lowell, goes back to Portugal 
and says, see you later, <laughs> and leaves her brother here. But by that point, her brother um, has settled in. She goes back. She buys a farm uh, in Portugal in Madeira and goes back to Portugal. Again, a fairly typical story. By the middle of the 1920s, as we've had all of this influx of immigration, as I said at the start, from Southern and Eastern Europe, <laughs> Wow, all these people, I hope, they are, you hope you're not all spying on me. Um, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, as, the, as this immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe um, has increased, in the United States, there actually begins to be, um, for one of the first times in our history, um, a really serious backlash against immigration. And so what's going to happen is these immigration restriction leagues are going to get set up. And a lot of them have their home base actually in Massachusetts. We tend to think of Massachusetts as fairly liberal when it comes to questions of immigration, uh, social rights, and things like that. Not so. And a lot of the brains behind this, and I'll put brains in quotes, are coming from, <laughs> our, from alumni of Harvard University who basically are going to argue, sounds somewhat familiar, immigrants bring poverty and crime. This is 1920. I heard somebody say what I didn't say. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was trying to hold my, uh, yeah. And so, and again, this idea that if you're from Southern or Eastern Europe, you're racially inferior to Anglo-Saxons and you're a threat to the American way of life. It does sound familiar. Um, it's nearly 100 years later, right? It's almost 2020. This is 1920, around this time, right? And so this is going to have a profound impact on Portuguese immigration. And again, sounds familiar as well. The birth rate, Stanford University, another leading light. <laughs> um, sociologist Edward Ross, basically, again, let's curtail immigration. If we don't, we're committing, in his words, race suicide. That too many people from Southern and Eastern Europe, too many people who are more um, more darkly complected, too, so, too many people who are hot-blooded Italian or Portuguese or Greek. Um, you're going to mess up the gene pool. Uh, and so we have to stop immigration from these places. And that's what we actually do. We pass a law in 1924 that severely impacts Portuguese, Portuguese migration into the United States. It virtually brings it to a halt. Because the quota system is going to be put in place, and the quota system is going to be based on how many people from particular countries are in the United States as of 1890. So in my classes at the university, this is where I usually do a quiz to see who's listening. When did the bulk of Portuguese immigrants begin to come into the United States? I heard it. Speak up. Please, students. <laughs> Tell me something. Pardon? The bulk, but the bulk of people are going to come in after 1900. So if you make the quota based on who's in the country in 1890, you diminish the number of people who can be allowed into the country. Follow? It's math, as my students tell me. Engineering students, when I do this, say, yeah, it's math. I say, yeah, but I'm the history teacher. Um, and so Portuguese immigration completely sort of dries up, if you will. For the entire decade of the 1930s, only about 3,300 people, Portuguese immigrants, are allowed into the country because of the quota. And in the 1940s, about 7,000, so less than 750 people a year. So this law is highly effective in controlling, limiting, whichever words you want to use, discriminating however, whatever vocabulary you want to use for it, um, to keep people out. This also coincides with the fact that uh, the mills in Lowell are ceasing operation. In 1940, 40% 40 of the population in Lowell is on some kind of relief because of the Great Depression, because of mill closures. Uh, there's just simply no work. Lots of immigrants who are here from a variety of places begin to leave. Lowell's population um, shrinks considerably. Um, there are still some mill jobs. This is mill workers the mid-20th century. <clears throat> I'm going to go quicker, being conscious of time. So one of the things that's going to happen now is 
Portuguese in the community here are going to begin to focus on helping people who are coming who have been here a while um, settle in, learn English. This is a naturalization class, citizenship class. Um, lots of the names of the people in the class are there along the bottom. Um, regularly conducted by, and I found this really fascinating, the, the Portuguese American Democratic Club of Wolf. Um, very engaged in the sort of citizenship naturalization activity, and this is back in the 1950s. Um, and they even planned something called the Cotton Frolic. I have no idea what that was. Um, but this is, again, the Portuguese American Democratic Club. Uh, a lot of names you may recognize of people uh, you know, that you know, relatives. Um, well, they help they help these almost every year, and they were basically a fundraiser for the for the Democratic Club. Club. Yeah. They don't still happen though, right? <laughs> Not that I know. We of. haven't had a cotton frolic lately, <laughs> have we? But I, I'm I'm unaware if we have. I mean, you know this. A lot of you know this history as well. But the next big wave um, is going to come with this volcanic eruption um, on the island of Palau, um, and somebody who's already here in the Portuguese community. Uh, this guy, Fermo Carrera, uh, writes to Kennedy, John Kennedy, when he's a senator, and says to uh, Kennedy, you've got to help us. The quota system that I just talked about a second ago is in place to the point that people who are suffering, who have been economically dislocated because of this volcano, can't get relief there, but they can't come here either because of the quota. Um, and so uh, my students who were working, on, working with me on the exhibit that's outside went to the Kennedy Library, and they called me from there all excited because they found the original of this letter that Fermo Carrera wrote to Kennedy. And they're practically crying. You can't believe what we found. You can't. I was not sure. I didn't know I wanted, if I wanted to add. I couldn't figure out what they were talking about. They said, we found the letter. I said, what letter? And then they read this to me, which was pretty incredible. Right? Um, and so the people at the Kennedy Library let them uh, make a photocopy of it so that we would have it, but, and I love this, with every good wish for the future, I am your humble Portuguese friend from Lowell, and it's just really brilliant, right? So imagine students finding this, like, and being, like, incredibly, um, I'm going to skip this, I'm going to, uh, in the interest of time. No, no, you're fine, uh, I'm just going to add that John Kennedy, of course, became a saint to the Portuguese. All the way back in the Azores, I was a little yeah. kid, very little kid when John Kennedy died. And I remember everybody in my home crying. You know, I was like four years old and people are crying uh, because John Kennedy had died. He basically was promoted to sainthood. Mm -hmm. okay. And Pastori, right, in Rhode Island? Yeah, and Pastori. Was was another, big yeah, but yeah, for sure, right? Um, so as this wave comes in and settles up on Lawrence Street area, it's sort of the neighborhood that we talked about earlier. Um, I found this in an oral history, people talking about purchasing what had been boarded up uh, houses because of the economic slump in the city with the mills closing. Lots of people left. Um, new folks coming in are able to purchase a lot of these triple deckers, fix them up, um, and start life over again. Dale in the mellow, um, whose profile out there in the exhibit becomes instrumental in helping people settle in through the international. Um, Institute, this is people, this, that's her right there. Um, she's always smiling in every photograph. She just like, seems like she really enjoyed the work that she was always doing in the community. Um, this is an International Institute uh, English language class. Um, and so last few slides to try to think about where this sort of went to in the 60s through the early 1980s. I again found a bunch of these oral histories over in the Center for World History uh, and read this one. Um, and um, he's talking about basically settling into the area, the neighborhood, opening a bakery, buying another bakery, combining bakeries, um, and recalling that uh, when he was a kid working for his dad in the initial bakery, he walked around the neighborhood with a basket and then a horse and finally a truck delivering bread in the neighborhood. I don't know about all of you, but when I was a kid, I grew up in Beverly, but I lived in a very sort of working class immigrant Italian neighborhood in Beverly, and every Friday a bread truck came around with bread and rolls for Sunday, like big long loaves of bread for the spaghetti and whatever, and 
and all of that, right? And this reminded me of that, that that would be a fairly um, typical thing. And then I found, again, sort of poking more, I found this photograph of the family. It's a newspaper photo, so it doesn't necessarily reproduce all that well, but it's three generations of that same family working in the bakery. Yes? Uh, well, my, my father actually owned the bakery. <laughs> okay. Before, uh, before that? Yeah, before Daniel Jr. Okay, good. We'll chat. It was called, <laughs> what was it called? It was called the Lusitania Bakery. And my, I used to kid him because I said, Dad, why would you, why would you name your business after a sandwich ship? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I didn't think of that at first, but yeah, why would you? That's <laughs> okay. Um, and so then his son, Manny Jr., goes to BU, graduates, but then comes back and operates the bakery and stays in the community as a member of the Portuguese club, is very active um, in the community. But I like this of three generations of, of people baking. Uh, lots of people working in Joan fabric. These are just interesting photos of, again, people that you might know. Um, radio becomes really important at this point in the community. There are a lot of Portuguese radio programs um, on fairly regularly. The community is very active in giving aid back when things happen um, somewhere else in Portugal um, as the community becomes more well established here. Fairly typical street scene. And then the la I want to finish with this because for those of you that live in Lowell, the connector has come up again. People are re-debating what to do with the connector. Um, and so in the 1960s, the city had a master plan um, of urban renewal. And one of the parts of it was this road, the connector. And this is what the road was going to be. It was going to go essentially right through the Portuguese neighborhood. It was going to basically cut it in half and basically go right entirely through. And people, so people had already been disrupted. The Jewish neighborhood of Hale Howard, where the train station is now, all of that had already been moved out. The connector had gone through there. Um, but at the point where it was sort of creeping toward um, the Lawrence Street area, people in the community organized themselves and essentially say, you're not coming through our neighborhood. We've spent all this time fixing this neighborhood up. We've restored all these triple deckers, all these abandoned properties. Um, we've got all this cultural life going on. We've got our grapes. Like, no, you're not, this road's not coming through here. Um, and so people form opposition to the extension of the connector. Neighborhood group gets formed. Uh, there's a newspaper, people organize door to door. This becomes this huge deal in the city because the power structure of Lowell is in favor of that road continuing through that neighborhood. So if you know where the connector ends now, if you've ever cursed the darkness at the end of that road trying to figure out, okay, how do I get downtown from here at 5.30, right? You can, in a way, blame the Portuguese community <laughs> for, for the road stopping where it stops. But at the same time, it's an excellent example of community organizing in a way that prevented something that would have been really destructive um, to the culture, to the life I've been describing, um, and that you all know as well, in that neighborhood. So the Lowell Sun, uh, WCAP, most of the banks, everybody was pretty much in favor of this road going through there. Uh, and people said no. The Sun, I mean, the, the Sun ran a ballot in the newspaper, um, and they told people they could only vote once. <laughs> like, how would you enforce this? I have no idea. Uh, but people were supposed to cut this out and mail it into the sun to get a sense of the city. Um, at one point, this was, they posted the vote, uh, 551 for, 1,354 against. Eventually, the connector gets stopped. Um, and this is another oral history I found, uh, where Manny Figuerera, basically Lawrence Street, Lived in the house for 39 years. This is a quote I found in the newspaper. I put my life into this property. You might as well take a gun and shoot me as have me move out. Right? 
Um, and then he says, um, you know, that we have to stand firm, we have to organize. This is his house, incredible garden all around it, like this multi-level garden that he's invested his life into. And he's saying, you know, basically he's sort of saying over my dead body, uh, is this road coming through here? Um, and then from another oral history um, that was done by the Lowell Folklife Project in 1987, that's actually a picture of him. Uh, you can't quite see it um, with the lighting, but he's, show, he's showing off to the people doing the interview his wine press. Uh, and he's getting ready. He basically saved a bunch of wine for an anniversary party on the stopping of the connector. Uh, and he's gonna, he wants to give the interviewers, and in the, in the oral history talks about wanting to give the interviewers some of the wine. Um, uh, but he wants to make sure he has enough. He needs several gallons for the party uh, that's coming up um, from the stopping of the connector. And I've done it in a one time. Yeah, questions? Answer a couple questions, yeah. Or comments. I'm full of something. I'm amazed by how different the cultures of immigrants affect the immigrants in different parts of the city, mm -hmm. particular, particularly the Portuguese and Mexican. So right. Do you know why? I don't, I mean, I don't know, like, exactly, exactly why. Some of it's a function of when people are coming uh, and the availability, what's, what's available for housing stock, right? And so lots of times, in, in, the early, in the late 19th, early 20th century, the acre became sort of the first stop for a lot of people because the housing stock was older and it was cheaper, relatively speaking, to the rest of the city, right? And so I'm sure it was the same. And some of it is where the, I mentioned before where the boarding houses were, so the key is to try to figure out why those boarding houses were there. Because then, as guys in those boarding houses either send back for their wife or go back home, get married, and come back, and are now married, they're going to probably want to stay in a neighborhood where there's more people, where there's more Portuguese people. I mean, so all the neighborhoods, it's clear in the research people have done, um, reflect the dominant culture, right? And so you've got churches, you've got bakeries, you've got markets, you've got the fish guy, you've got the bread guy, right? All that's in your neighborhood, right? And so you want to stick around where that is. Eventually, Second generation, third generation might stay in Lowell, but then they're going to end up like, I mean, I live in Centerville. A lot of second and third generation are going to live like on Christian Hill up in Centerville, or if they're really lucky, maybe Belvedere. Um, but so lots of times that's like a move eventually out. So a lot of people in the acre, their kids end up in Centerville. Um, and the grandparents, so they stay local. They need a grandma to take care of the kids. Uh, or, or what have you, right? And so, I mean, another thing is function of triple deckers. So in a lot of these neighborhoods, there's three families. And so for people to begin the American dream odyssey, if you will, buying a triple decker is the, is the key. Because you can rent the top two floors, they pay the mortgage on the building, that property that you own, and then if, you, if you've got a fairly stable job, maybe you buy another one. And then maybe you buy one across the street, and eventually now you own three or four of these. Or you buy one and you send back for grandma and grandpa and your, and your brother and, and sister, and they're living in the building too, and then again, you've got built-in daycare. Grandmothers are largely seen as built-in daycare. Um, still are. Still are, yeah. I, I, would, I, I, would say that's, I would say that's true, right? But again, lots of women worked in the mills. And so if you're going to work at 6 a.m., what are you going to do with your kids? But if grandma's upstairs... Right, and she's speaking Portuguese. The kids are learning Portuguese a bit, and you've got, you know. Okay, yes. Um, we we in Lowell we've experienced so many waves of you know immigrant communities during this time period. Uh, what were the other major immigrant groups that were uh, in Lowell? So nineteen early 20, early twentieth yeah. century, like, so in the in the early. In the early 1900s, the people, there would have been a small but significant population from places like Lithuania and Poland. There would have been an Eastern European Jewish influx uh, around, between around 1910 and 1930, coming from Poland, coming from Russia. 
we would have also been a sizable Greek population coming. Greeks would have been in the acre, mm -hmm. around where the beautiful Greek church is. That was known as the Greek Triangle Acre. So largely, I would say, again, with some variation, between 1900 and 1930, the bulk of people coming to Lowell are coming from what we would refer to as Southern and Eastern Europe. And the sort of Western European, German, French, Scandinavian migration has somewhat stopped. Right? Now it's diff completely different again. I mean, now we're in a completely different. Yes? I'm curious a little bit more about how Portuguese stopped the connection. How Portuguese stopped the connection? Yes. Uh, there was any riot or any no. Any, 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 no. Any institutions, the little, all institutions were against. Uh, well, the institute, the institution that the institution that was against the extension of the connector was the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church had already seen Little Canada go away, and the di diminishment of French Canadian Catholic parishes in the city, and so it was sort of like, oh, we're not going to do this again, are we? And so the churches in the neighborhood organized against, and the churches actually funded a community newspaper that was called The Communicator. Mm. <laughs> and people took it door to door and organized in the neighborhood. And then eventually what happened was the strength of the, as I understand the history from talking to people that were involved, the strength of the, of the movement in the neighborhood was influential enough to persuade some people in the city council who at one time had been in favor of the connector going through um, to vote against it. And so there's a huge, there are several of these really that sound like amazing community meetings at City Hall where the neighborhood brings hundreds of people. There's people, describes like people outside, people inside, you know, not a riot, but people being very vocal about we don't want the road. Um, to the point that then when the city council finally votes, as memory serves, I believe it's five to four to stop it where it is, the, in that abrupt way that it ends. But the plan was, if you can imagine, again, if you're familiar with the area, the plan was that that was going to go straight through, and it was going to end up, so where the university's um, in and conference center is now, where Middlesex Community College's building is downtown, the road would have gone right through there and out onto Merrimack Street. It would have come onto Merrimack Street right sort of adjacent almost to the auditorium. So imagine that swath of six-lane road going that way through all of that part of the city. So the historic preservation, um, all the stuff that we, that at least I like, I'm hoping you all like today, that basically would have been gone. That road would have essentially gone right through there. So Wang Tower, like the ability of Wang to have built that building, which is now Middlesex, uh, the hotel that was there, which is now the University and the Conference Center, none of that would be there. That would be six lanes of road. So think about that, like what that would look like. Yes. Yeah, so I, um, I recall at that time there was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Freiters, yes. who I believe Ray has done some research on that. I think he was from Chelmsford. He lived in Lowell, went to Chelmsford, and he was very involved with the church. And my brother, who had arrived in the country, I think maybe one or two years, um, <coughs> the, the Father Silver at that time. Um, he was very involved with the church, and I recall my brother going around with Mr. Freitas, knocking on doors, yep. and, and getting, mobilizing people. But yes, the church was um, the impetus to get it, to, to stop it, because yep. everybody went to church. Um, and that was our only outlet that we had at that time, where everybody got together. So that was, I, I remember that. And like I said, I know Saint Ray Anthony, has done some research on that. St. Anthony's the Portuguese yeah. church, and St. Peter's the Irish church mm -hmm. came together. Because it would have really created some problems for both parishes. Yeah. But I think it's also important to note the, um, of the organizing across ethnic groups mm -hmm. was really key to the dynamic of stopping the acres. So the Portuguese community was important, but organizing across you know, to the Irish and the French was key to stopping yeah. Yeah, because that's what it took to get the council vote. Time for one more. Yes, if I may. And I'm being um, yanked off stage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's a whole lot of questions, but my family was from Madeira and reflected here 1914 to 1924. But they were part of the population that returned to Portugal and never returned, but mm -hmm. left the three children that were born here that enabled us to come back. What portion of the population returned to the old country? So 
different um, different groups return in different rates, but in general, right? This is a, this is a generalization of all the immigrants who came between 1900 and 1930. About a third did not stay. It's higher for some groups than for others. For Southern Italians, it's about 60 percent. People face, which, which we don't have time to get into, but people face a fair amount of discrimination. And then again, by 1925, 30, think from the start, people are coming because there's work. Now there's no work, right? I mean, in Lowell in 1930, there were fewer people working in textile mills than there were in like 1835. So there's no work. So am I going to stay or am I going to go back and try my luck again back home or whatever? So the Global Depression encourages some people to leave the lack of work. But yeah, high, high, high percentages. And what, it didn't work out. It doesn't get taught that way, but the research that people have been doing lately makes it really clear. It's also interesting, I'll be really quick with this, but in the Second World War, when people are going through Italy and Greece, they're bumping into people that had lived in the United States and speak English, and they become incredibly helpful to our troops figuring out what the hell's going on with the enemy. Because they're still loyal in an odd way, even though they've gone back, and they see GIs and they think, oh, and they go speak English and talk to them, and through that venue, they get a lot of intelligence that they might not have gotten otherwise. So the global link is really fascinating. Anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you, Bob. The thing that I love about Bob is that he takes history and makes it relatable to all of us. Um, I would just like to see who in the audience is currently doing research on Portuguese history. Could you raise your hands? And could you look around at each other? Because this is a great connector during the breaks for people to, to have conversations about what you're working on um, and how we can move forward the history of the Portuguese people. And I'll also ask one more question. How many people, as you were watching Bob's presentation, were thinking of your families? I was sitting there going, oh, yeah, settled in a farm in Westport, check. My grandmother ran a boarding house, check. My father was involved in all fraternal organizations, check. Um, so this is a fabulous day for us all to connect on that level. The, the National Park Service is really very hugely fortunate in the city of Lowell because of University of Massachusetts of Lowell. We have a very, very strong partnership um, in this building on the third floor is the Sangus Industrial History Center, which is our partnership together, an education center that we run. More than 40,000 children and teachers come to learn about Lowell's history. And one of the programs, the Yankees and Immigrants Program, the children take on different roles of immigrant families who came and settled in Lowell, one of those, of course, being a Portuguese family. So we are very proud of our partnership. That is just one of the many things we do together today is another perfect example. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our partner, the Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts Lowell, Jackie Maloney. I'll try to do as good as Professor Florence. I'm here. Hiding on Yes. <laughs> well, welcome everybody on this beautiful spring day. To those of you who are mothers, happy Mother's Day for tomorrow. I uh, also like to wish a very special happy birthday to Emily Byrne for that week. <laughs> uh, what, a, what a great presentation and what a great way to celebrate the rich history of this great city, which has been welcoming immigrants really for hundreds of years, immigrants who have enriched not only this city, but this entire region and the Commonwealth. Uh, you can imagine for me every day what an honor it is to come and to lead UMass Lowell and lead faculty like Professor Ferrand and Professor Souza, who do incredible work at the university. And when you listen to Professor Ferrand's enthusiasm for his teaching, the way he engages his students, and also the way he himself is personally deeply involved in this city, similar to Professor Souza. So, Please join me again and protect your I would also like to, like to welcome and thank our senators who are here, Senator Pacheco, Senator Rodriguez, and also 
our uh, representative, Representative Silva, and Representative. Uh, Oh, I got it. <laughs> Senator, uh, I want to call you Senator Sorry, Representative Cabral. Thank you all for your support of the university, which enables us to do this kind of work in the community and with our students. So thank you all. Thank you for taking the time to be here and visit this great city and be a part of this panel. How proud our Portuguese community is of all that you do for the Commonwealth. Thank you also to Congresswoman Tapan, who is doing a fabulous job representing us in Washington, D.C. We've seen her all over the press already working so hard. She's been at the university numerous times looking at the work that we're doing to make sure that she takes the message to Washington that the work going on here in this Commonwealth is important. So thank you, Congresswoman Tapan. To this community. It's really also, I have to thank my good friend Lisa Saab, who's standing over here. And, and Bob, when you were talking about uh, Mrs. Was it Mello? Uh, and how she always had a great smile. Whatever she was doing, she had a great smile. And when I think of Lisa Saab, of course, everything she does, there it is. <laughs> Things this year happened for the Portuguese community. So many great events, the beautiful photography exhibit we had at the university, of course, today. But what topped it all was that incredible concert with Marie Phil when we had close to 1,500 people here at the university at, at the Lowell Auditorium. It was absolutely fabulous. So, congratulations to the Portuguese Study Center for all you do. Frank, fantastic job. To the advisory board, thank you for keeping this center thriving in the way that it is and bringing all these great things to the city of Lowell. Thanks for being here. So um, we are very, very fortunate to have our Congresswoman here today, um, Lori Trahan, and I would like to invite her now up to the podium to say a few words. Well, thank you for letting me come and be a part of, of this today. Uh, and congratulations to the university, uh, five years with the South Center for Portuguese Studies. It's such a gift. Uh, a place where I haven't spent nearly enough time, but I look forward to getting a little rested in uh, August and bringing my mom, who is a, a self-proclaimed genealogist, <laughs> to, uh, to come uh, sort of thread all the pieces together. You know, during uh, Professor Thrun's uh, presentation, which I've now seen twice, I was reminded of all of those things that we talk about in, in our family. My, my grandfather on my dad's side came from uh, Porto, and he, he was a union carpenter here uh, in Lowell. And my grandmother on my dad's side uh, was Brazilian. Her mom passed away. She was raised in Graciosa. And then she came and, mm. and uh, worked in one of those mills. My, my grandfather, uh, and so we were, my dad's name is Loreiro. My mom's uh, maiden name is Sousa. And her great grandfather was one of the founding members of St. Anthony's Parish. And so, you know, when you showed that connector picture, mm -hmm. it was that was going right through Katy Street, where yep. I remember visiting and seeing all the peach trees and the wine in the basement, uh, but also collecting rent because they did yep. uh, ascend to have one, not a triple decker, but a double. Uh, but it's uh, it's just such an honor uh, to um, to be uh, to have the, this the study of our culture right here in Lowell. Uh, you know, it's. Um, I'm proud to be the, the first woman uh, of Portuguese descent representing uh, our community. And I, was just, I was just in Hudson celebrating the 100th anniversary of the, uh, of the Portuguese American Center there. And, you know, it was, this, is a, this is a community that came and worked hard. I mean, they came on the values of having a better life for themselves and for their for their families and future generations. And so it's not, um, it's so much a testament of what we achieved since coming. 
uh, to the United States. You know, I, I look at the delegation, the state delegation, uh, uh, and everything that they've accomplished as being a part of a huge Azorian and Portuguese population, whether it's in Southeastern Mass, in this district for me, it's in Hudson and here in Lowell. And, uh, and so if not, if that hadn't existed, uh, I would never have the honor of being the first woman uh, representative in the House. Uh, so I'm proud to co-chair the Portuguese American uh, Caucus. I'm also proud that my very first trip as a member of Congress will be to Lisbon in just a couple of weeks. <laughs> I hope we can have some better wine than the wine that uh, was made on Katie Street. Uh, I was too young to drink it, but I remember spitting it out when uh, we were to taste. Um, so it's just an honor to be here, and uh, and I look forward to continuing uh, the work with uh, the Saad, who have been so great, not just to our community, our Portuguese community, but also to our, our local community, and making sure that, look, this country was built on the stories of my grandparents, of your parents and grandparents, uh, and that's what we need to continue. That's what we need to uh, um, uh, make sure that we protect so that uh, this thriving immigrant population that exists in our country and will exist for generations to come will always be there. So thank you so much for being here today and letting me be a, a part of it.